I think before we go on to talk more about some of the available systemic therapies, I want to uh, just discuss one other aspect of somatostat analogs. Uh, Diane, you talked about the PROMID study, the Clarinet study, using somatostat analogs for tumor control. Uh, but this whole idea of tumor control and somatostat analogs is really quite recent. That's We've right. had these drugs for decades right. and used them for hormonal symptoms. So how, right. how do you use somatostat analogs in that, in that context? So I think certainly for a functional patient, uh, there's never been a question that you put them on the somatostat analogs, and they're usually on there for life. Uh, the question um, that was always come up is, you know, does it truly work for tumor control or not? Um, and even today, there are people like, ah, it doesn't work. So <laughs> I, I do think it's important to highlight, for example, the clarinet study, which is the most recent study that was conducted using lanreotide. Uh, it was 200 patients that were randomized to either 120 milligrams of subcutaneous lanreotide or deep subcutaneous um, and versus uh, sort of a best supportive care plus placebo. Um, there are two important parts of that study. So the progression-free survival on the placebo arm was 18 months. Again, this is a very selected population, but 18 months on the placebo arm, on that active surveillance. You know, right. we can watch patients for a year and a half before they grow. But really, in an exciting way, the experimental arm at two years still hasn't met the primary endpoint of progression-free survival. So that at two years, the patients on lanreotide still haven't progressed in a drug that's really well tolerated. I mean, that's exciting. Um, so I think that we've, we have shown now with great evidence that in fact there is cytostatic control there. Um, so certainly in patients with non-functional tumors that are growing, and again, when do you pull the trigger? Uh, how much do they have to grow is a clinical judgment for each patient has to be individualized. Um, but I think that time is on our side based on the placebo arm to say when they grow, this cytostatic agent can help us control your disease better. Yeah. And so for, for a patient uh, who may have symptoms of hormone secretion, uh, uh, let's say a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor patient, uh, Pam, there are a whole lot of different syndromes. Are there mm -hmm. some syndromes that seem to respond better to somatostatin analogs? I mean, I think classically, they, you know, we use them for carcinoid syndrome, yeah. which were patients with small bowel metastatic disease, typically who have a serotonin secreting tumor. We often measure that in the urine as a 5-HIA level, um, and these are the patients with flushing and diarrhea. Though I will use somatostatin analogs for most um, syndromes, with the exception, I think, being careful with insulinomas. Um, and, and I think that we typically will start with both a long and a short acting. There's some controversy as to whether a test dose needs to be used, and everyone can comment on that if they want. Right. But I think that it can often take the long acting about two weeks to kick in. So for folks that you are starting and who are really in desperate need of hormone control, we will start a short acting um, octreotide in addition to long acting. And certainly, you know, so for VIP, for example, you can see a dramatic yes, improvement once you yes. start that smenistan analogs. Yeah. But perhaps for gastronoma, um, just a proton pump yeah. inhibitor may be yeah. sufficient. So yeah. I think that may also be the other type of hormone that yeah. you don't necessarily need to jump into a somatostatin analog because you get such great control with the yeah. PPI. That's true. There's another, another uh, less common use of somatostatin analogs that, that involves the surgeons. <laughs> uh, people come in and they talk about carcinoid crisis. Uh, Rod, <laughs> what is carcinoid crisis? How do you treat it? And does it ever occur in patients with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors? Well, a carcinoid crisis is basically a hemodynamic instability uh, thought to be due to massive release of hormones in the systemic circulation that, that overwhelms uh, the patient's ability to cope. And um, one of the, or two of the very well-known triggers for this are anesthesia and surgery. And so um, certainly when we're dealing with carcinoid patients, we have to watch out for carcinoid sin uh, crisis. Um, it has been considered dogma for years that, you know, giving a somatostatin analog is prophylactic against this. And I think, you know, Phil's institution and mine have, have slightly different outcomes. Um, there really only was one paper for a lot of years that came out of the Mayo Clinic that said it might be prophylactic. And what they noted was that if they didn't give any um, octreotide during an operation or before an operation, 10% of patients had an event that was chiefly a systolic blood pressure going less than 80 and staying there for 10 minutes or more. And uh, when they gave it, they said it went to zero. So it seems like complete total prophylaxis. Um, different recommendations abound. Uh, there's, there's a 
endocrine textbook, endocrine surgery textbook by a famous surgeon who shall remain nameless, but his initials are Norm Thompson, that says if you just put a patient on LAR, nothing will happen in the operating room. Um, so I've been studying this systematically, and um, my first paper, we looked at LAR and a preoperative bolus. And we found that actually, if we used the definitions the Mayo Clinic used, so actually it was very nerve wracking. When the blood pressure dropped, I had to sit there and do nothing for 10 minutes before I could even call it a carcinoid crisis by their definition and try to get a measurement on this. Uh, and then we would start treating it. And we found that that happened 27% of the time. And it happened in functional and non-functional patients, almost exclusively in patients with liver metastases any point in the operation from induction to closing the skin. Um, so we said, well, you know, that doesn't seem to work. We then tried intraoperative doses, um, and we still found that even with an intraoperative dose, patients could go on and have another subsequent crisis. So my latest study, we looked at infusion, and we were running an infusion. There are, again, the recommendations abound between 50 micrograms an hour all the way up to 500 micrograms per hour. And the British even put people in the hospital a day before surgery and continue it two days after. Um, so we decided just to test 500 micrograms per hour. And it turned out that patients who had a crisis in the operating room in the first study, they had a 40% major postoperative complication rate. So this hurts them to have their blood pressure go that low. So we ran the infusion uh, at 500 micrograms per hour, and we had very strict definitions. We said, we know what a crisis looks like. If it, we're not bleeding, we're not twisting the cave and stuff like that, we'll call it a crisis and start treating it immediately. And with the, it, it happened at the same rate, 30%. And so we did not show that drips actually had any impact. By treating it immediately, we shortened the average duration from 19 minutes to eight, and that cut the link with complications. They are, they're no longer linked with complications. So right now, I'm, I'm starting another study. We're now doing echocardiography and Swan-Gans catheters um, during all operations because no one really knows, is it vasodilation? Is it heart failure? Is it pulmonary vascular resistance or some combination thereof? Well, we're getting really interesting data that I don't want to spill the beans on tonight. <laughs> but um, the, uh, we're hoping that this will give us the actual tool to treat it rapidly and maybe even ultimately right. prevent it. And the answer to your original question that started this long parade is yes, we do see it with pancreatic we neuroendocrine too. tumors, there both too. functional and non-functional. And Phil, I'd be interested in your comments on we, that. We see it with both functional and non-functional. Right. And we do use infusion, high dose, 250 to 500 mics. Uh, but we, our incidence of crisis with that regimen has been closer to 5%, and I'm not sure what the difference is, unless no. maybe eating crawfish has something to do with it. <laughs> well, it could be the definition because and I our mean, definition was not the same as yours because we didn't. Yeah. We didn't. A. We didn't let it go ten minutes. Right. Because if your anesthesiologist is jumping on it, then you're not going to capture it. You have to actually right. set up the study to yeah. just sit right. and watch it. Right. And I think if you look at the what we'd call the oh my god, this patient might die type crisis, we're at 5% on a drip. Hmm. So it right. would match fairly closely. Yeah. So no, no consensus on doses on drips, but uh, I think probably we do have a consensus that this is something that is really important. I think is, is still better than a single pre-op dose, yep. except for things like endoscopies and biopsies and outpatient things exactly. like that. But if you're doing something where there's a likelihood of you're manipulating the tumor, right. then um, under general anesthesia, an infusion, I think, based on our mutual experiences of a 5% incidence of life-threatening crisis, I think is justified. Okay. And do you see the burden of disease correlate with the syndrome or the, with the crisis? In those 5% of patients, do they have heavier tumor burden? Yes, or? those people walk in purple. They so it's really, you can sort of look for a more high-risk patient population to And those people are the ones that patient. have given us the biggest squeeze to our coronaries. And you know you're in for some challenges. If they, if they walk in and they are flushed all the time, despite they're on triple-dose mm -hmm. somatostatin analogs of, you know, very high dose and their syndrome is still not controlled, then you know you're in trouble. Great. Uh, to talk about risk factors, what correlated in multivariate analysis for crisis in our study was presence of carcinoid syndrome, female age, and length of operation. Those actually correlated. 
and I don't know about the length of operation, is it that that's a reflection of burden of disease? I think not, because sometimes I'm just going and taking out a primary and somebody whose liver I can't debulk. That's a short operation, uh, but they have a high, high burden. Um, the 5-HIAA and chromogranin A did not correlate with mm. crisis at all. Mm -hmm. um, they mm -hmm. were not significant. No, I think the message is it happens. It happens more frequently than you think, and don't place any kind of total reliance on prophylaxis. Be prepared to treat it with vasopressors and fluid so that you can get the blood pressure up as quickly as you can.